and uh, went to the committee. I even went to the harbour master, Brian Sheridan, and Brian weighed in behind me. And the committee seemed to be weighing in behind me. They even came along to a, a gig I did in Galway. It's strange, <coughs> actually, when I play in Limerick, the last few times, uh, it's a bit like your man in the Bible, isn't it? Uh, every time I come home, the, the crowds get smaller. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you wouldn't expect a big crowd for a book launch, especially for uh, a folk singing maybe. But anyway, the, um, that whole uh, proposal went uh, off the rails and I ended up, I ended up uh, fairly, feeling fairly sour after it because I pursued it so much. But I firmly believe in, that there's some kind of meaning to life and that there's a spirit there that conducts things. And uh, three months or three years after I, I lost that commission to do, do the Galway Ocean thing in, in Galway. I got a, a brown envelope out of the blue from Derry inviting me to come to Derry because they were putting on the, the Volvo Ocean Race uh, event. It was coming to their town and they were having a big maritime festival to go with it. And um, when we got there, or a few days before I got, we got there, I got a, another call asking me would I, would I mind singing the voyage down in, down in the marina area where the docks or the boats, the clippers they call them, were going to be setting off down the foil and back out to sea. And I jumped at the opportunity uh, and we had to go up the evening before because it was an early event. And my daughter came with me because she was playing on another event that I was doing on a main stage in, in the festival. But I had been invited now to sing down on the marina itself. So when we got to Derry, we went straight down there to see where I was going to be singing. And there was no sign of a stage anywhere. Uh, my daughter kind of surmised that maybe they would set it up in the morning because it was very busy, it was packed. I don't know if you were in Galway during the Galway Ocean was, but it was terrific. Great atmosphere. And it was like that in Derry uh, as well. <coughs> but um, just as we were leaving, my granddaughter Katie pointed to a little raft out in the marina area and said, maybe you'll be singing out there. Huh? And I said, no, no that's, there's no microphone out there. There's no... There's nothing to, you wouldn't be able to do that. But when we came back the following morning, um, the attendant who was, who was keeping an eye on the, um, the, the whole area told me that that's exactly what I was singing. And they, he called it a pontoon and it had lovely crenellated uh, bunting and, and, and all sorts of stuff. And there were two speakers out there and a uh, microphone and I was conducted out there and they set me adrift. So I was out sailing. And the first thing I noticed when I looked to my left was uh, a ship, the, the, the Skull and Bones, and there was a pirate ship across the way. And I felt, <laughs> I was kind of in seventh heaven really because uh, my song The Voyage actually was inspired by Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, which I loved as a kid. Um, so anyway, we arrived back and at 8.30 we checked out at the hotel and drove through empty silent streets till we found a parking spot close to the river. After we took our instruments from the book, Kate insisted on carrying my guitar bag strapped to her back while we made our way along the empty quay towards the marina. As we approached the gate leading to the jetty, we could see no sign of a performing platform anywhere in the vicinity. Our attention was drawn to the line of clipper yachts lined up in full sail along the outside of the berthing ramp. There were no crews on board the boats and, and, and our officials along the quayside, except for this one man, gatekeeper with an identity badge, standing at the open gate, who nodded when I asked for directions to the performing area. Turning to the river, he pointed towards the blue and white canopied pontoon floating a little way out from the jetty. 
the raft that Katie had suggested might be on the performing platform the evening before. And he smiled. As far as I know, that's where you were going to be singing. There was a man out there early this morning setting up a PA system. Look, you can see the microphones and speakers from here. But you're early, the proceedings aren't set to go, get underway until 10.30. So we skip a bit. I made my way down to the jetty and had a quick consultation with the sound engineer. His desk was on a platform at the end of the jetty. Then boarding the pontoon, I did a, a sound check and seated between two monitor wedges while the bobbing raft was being pushed away from the berthing ramp. As well as being wired to some speakers mounted on each side of the floating pontoon, the PA desk was connected to lamppost speakers running all the way down the quay to the Peace Bridge. When I was satisfied with my guitar and vocal sound, I gave the engineer the thumbs up and then sat back and let my eyes drift along the long line of expectant faces on the waterfront, spotting my daughter and granddaughter among them. As the 10.30 deadline for the departure of the Clippers approached, the MC interviewed a few local dignitaries, including Derry's Lord Mayor, on the topic of the success of the festival, then started communicating to the growing crowds of quayside onlookers, preparing them for the imminent ceremony of the undocking of the yachts. A recording of Danny Boy came over the intercom, and the Derry air began to vibrate with an almost palpable tone that eventually merged with a rumbling sound that turned out to be the Red Arrows flying squad, which appeared in the sky out of nowhere and swooped down in chevron formation above the clippers, leaving a trail of red, white and blue arching in the sky above the yachts. Why not green, white and gold, I wonder? When the aerial display came to an end, the clippers began to move away from the moorings and file out into the centre of the foil in slow formation, one behind the other. After the speed and noise of the jets, the slow, silent thrill of the departing yacht seemed an anticlimax until the crowd along the quay began to cheer and wave. The crews on board the yachts in turn waved back at the quayside onlookers from the decks of the clippers, and the whole riverside area became animated. While this was going on, I heard my name being introduced over the intercom by the MC who asked the crowds to sing along with the famous ballad I was about to perform. Though I hadn't planned a preamble before starting to sing, I found myself thanking the city of Derry as a limerick man for the honour of singing my most popular song for the departing crews. A tremor entered my voice as I started to sing, but my nerves steadied during the opening verse. When I reached the first chorus, I looked along the quayside and noticed that many of the onlookers were singing with me, though I could barely hear their voices. By the end of the second chorus, the whole stretch of the crowd, as far as the eye could see, had joined in and were singing and swaying to the rhythm I was str strumming on my guitar. As a final flourish, I glanced over my shoulder and gave a nod in the direction of the departing yachts, while hitting a final chord and raising my vocal tone to a higher pitch. Love is a boat. Bon voyage. Anyway, to put a long story short, the following morning, a front page featuring the Belfast Telegraph headed legendary send-off as thousands bid farewell to Clipper Yachts, described how local singer-songwriter Johnny Doohan performed his hit The Voyage during the Parade of Sail. After the way I emphasised my Limerick origins while introducing the song on, on the pontoon, I'm not sure how the journalist got his facts wrong, but given that the city of Derry afforded me one of the highlights of my career, I felt more than happy with the adoption. So that's the end of that one. Um, i just read you another one before I sing the voyage. And then those who need to get away early should leave, you know. <laughs> 151. This is a, this is a gig that, that I played. It's called My First Song. It's one of my favorite chapters in the, in the book. Um, Sunlight seeping through a gap in the curtains of my hotel room woke me just after seven. I got out of bed, drew back the drapes. The river sea glittered before me with this door race course in the background. An elderly man walking a dog on the narrow pathway by the riverside brought John B. Keane to mind. 
It was said that Listowel's most famous writer had walked this path every day of his adult life. During my performance at St. John's Art Centre the night before, I had drawn on a royal remark made by John B. on the late late show a few years before he died as an opening joke before singing The Voyage, the title song of my show. Marriage is an ongoing war in which there are occasional outbreaks of peace. The quotation drew the expected laugh from the small crowd and paved the way for the night's artistic success, which compensated somewhat for its commercial failure. After dressing, I totted up my earnings for the night before, 75 euro on CD and book sales and 200 representing slightly more than the 70% of the door, which the manager of the centre, Joe, was generous enough to give me. After deducting my various expenses, I calculated that my profit for the night was roughly 120 euro. Measured against two days travelling plus practice time, the sum amounted to mild depression. During breakfast in the near empty dining room downstairs, I recall a burning sensation that had come over me just before I went on stage the night before, after I learned that less than 20 people had shown up to see me. I had experienced this feeling many times in the past in similar circumstances, but never with such intensity. Thinking back on it now, as I swallowed some hard-boiled egg, brought to mind a passage from Dante's Purgatory, where the poet is forced to step through fire to purify himself before entering Eden to meet Beatrice. The spotlight I had stepped into the previous night more than singed my pride, but once I made my contact, eye contact with the small audience and cracked John B.'s marriage gag, I gained courage to put my heart and soul into singing the voyage with more spirit than I'd ever sang in the past. And I went down from there to give one of the most intense shows of my career, singing the many songs I've written over the years on family relationships and family history, including a song called Inviolate, which I had never sang on the stage before because of personal family revelations exposed in the raw lyric. The loud round of applause I received took me by surprise and after the show I was deeply affected when an elderly lady who had attended my performance with her daughter took the trouble of coming to my hotel room or to hotel just to let me know how moved she'd been by the song. I recalled her sunken eyes on the verge of tears as she complimented me, and I guessed that the song's lyric, written for a deceased brother of mine who died before I was born, had resurrected some similar tragedy from her past. Reflecting on this now as I munched toast and sipped coffee gave me a feeling of elation, far beyond any feeling of success money might bring. I think this up. Together we set sail With no maps to guide us We steered our own course Whether the storms When the winds were gale force Set out the doldrums with patience and hope Working together we learn Love is a golden troubled water It keeps us afloat When we started a voyage It was just me and you But now, look around us We have our own We're in a relationship 
filled with care to last the whole trip. Our true destination is not marked on a chart, oh, but we're navigating for the shore of the heart. When we started the voyage, it was just me and you. Look around us, we have a Started the voyage, there was just me and you. But now, look around us, we have our crew. There was a time when I used to play in pubs, but I stopped after this particular game. Um, this one's called the Cup, and it starts off like this. As the coach was pulling into Cork's bus terminal, I was struck by a passage in the book I was reading, Revelations of Divine Love by Julian of Norwich. I understood, I underlined the sentence, but didn't have time to reread it. I stuffed the paper back into the pouch of my guitar bag and got ready to change buses for the second leg of my long journey south. Now the reason I was heading south was I had been booked into an art centre down in, uh, I forget where it was, but uh, I had uh, a free night before uh, the next gig. So I didn't want to go home and then come back down again. So I took a uh, a gig that a friend of mine, that I thought he was a friend, suggested that I, I um, do this gig in, in the pub in his hometown. So, when we arrive at the, at, at the, at the place, this will give you a, an idea of the kind of room I was going to be seeing. The lounge turned out to be a large room with tacky furniture, a rancid smell stale tobacco, sour beer and urine was overpowering. Resting on a shaky foundation of plastic beer crates, a small makeshift stage was positioned right beside the ladies' toilet. A single microphone in the centre of the stage was connected to a small amplifier with two of its three control knobs missing. At the front and the side of the stage, green plastic tables and chairs stood on a green and purple arabesque carpet the busy design of which was threadbare and mottled with black bullseye burn holes. Old-fashioned wall lights with pink frilly shades glowed at irregular intervals on three of the rust-coloured walls. While I was trying to regulate the sound system, the boss came into the lounge and introduced himself. I hope the PA is okay. It's a pretty basic end, but we have bands here all the time and they have no complaints. Dressed in a wrinkled suit with a pinched brown hat cocked slightly over one eye, the bar owner had the look of a sharp cattle dealer. After some small talk, I went back to trying to readjust the bass control of the amplifier. With great effort, I managed to twist the knobless holder up a notch, but it had little effect on the trebly sound of the system. To compensate for the lack of Bottom end, I turned the treble knob back a few notches. This made the sound slightly better, but it was still lacking body, and there was a loud buzzing sound coming from the speakers, which I couldn't get rid of, probably due to the fact that the PA was unearthly. Realizing that no amount of adjustment would improve things, I ran over a song and then joined the boss at the front of the stage. It should be okay, it's a small enough room. The boss squinted beneath the rim of his hat. 
We've had a fair bit of interest. We're hoping for a big turn. I took the bull by the horns. We have no cover charge in us. The boss shifted the hat further down over his eye. Punters around here are a bit shy of cover charges. I know you said you wanted one, but I was afraid it might frighten them off. I don't mind paying you from the till. It's not that. Cover charges let people know it's not just background music they're coming to hear. It also keeps old troublemakers. The boss forced to laugh. Ah, you needn't worry about that. I have two strong books, Patsy and Jamesy, who take care of any rowdies we get in. Realising that it was pointless, pursu pointless pursuing the matter, I headed off to the nearby B&B that was booked for me. The room I was given had ugly floral and wallpaper mottled with damp patches. Rather than sit there depressing myself, I walked around town for an hour, then had fish and chips in a roadside cafe. At 8 o'clock I sauntered back to the venue with still a while to go before showtime. Serving behind the counter, the boss gave me a wink while I was passing through the lounge. Give it another 15 minutes, the crowd hasn't started coming yet. I sat in the dark corner of the lounge, sipping a glass of water, taking deep breaths in fearful anticipation of having to play to an empty house. As the minutes dragged by, a few people came in and sat at the tables furthest removed from the stage. The boss arrived looking depressed. You might as well start, the noise might bring in a few more in from the bar. Reluctantly, I got to my feet and started heading towards the stage. A loud commotion started up behind my back. As I turned to see what was up, the lounge door burst open and a crowd of 30 or 40 came clamouring into the room with a fellow waving a silver cup hoisted above, hoisted above their shoulders. One of the groups spoke to the boss, then the cup was passed behind the bar while it was filled with a mixture of beer and spirits. I backed away from the stage and stood outside the ladies' toilet watching the cup being passed around. After everyone in the group had taken a drink, the crowd jostled towards the stage and sat at the surrounding tables laughing and joking. Trays of beer were quickly brought to them by the ginger-haired barman. The boss came towards me grinning. They won the county cup. No one was expecting it, but they did it fair play to them. They won't be staying long. Their captain, Mikey, is a big fan of yours. He asked me to ask you to sing The Voyage. It's his favourite song. They played it at his wedding a few months back. Dedicate it to the team, will you? I gave a false laugh, glancing at the rowdy crowd. You want me to sing before them? The boss looked around the room. There's other punters here who have come a long way to see you. It'll be fine. I'll get up first and ask the lads to tone it down a bit. The boss's call for order fell on deaf ears. Within the team captain hopped up and roared for silence. The crowd immediately went quiet and, ma and I, ma I made my way to the microphone and congratulated the team on their big win. After a huge cheer, I dedicated my opening song to Mike. I am a sailor, you are my first mate. We signed on together, couple of fail. The whole team joined in for the chorus, life is an ocean, love is a boat. At the end of the song, while the team members were clapping and shouting, Mikey brought the cup to the stage and offered me a drink. I looked at the frothy liquid swilling around in the silver goblet and took a sip. While I was heading back to the microphone, a voice bellowed up a request for a Wolf Tones number. I explained that I didn't know any Wolf Tones songs and started to announce one of my own titles. Before I got through naming it, the Wolf Tones fan jumped up on stage, grabbed the microphone, asking me to back him on guitar. Before I had a chance to object, he started singing. Though I didn't know the chord structure of the song, I tried to follow the singer as best I could. Mid midway through the first verse, he dropped a couple of tones, wavered for a line or two, and then went back up and wobbled in high C to the end of the song. Amazingly, the crowd gave the chance of a loud round of applause. With the microphone back in my control, I decided that following my planned program was out of the question, so I launched into, If I Were a Rich Man. The crowd sang along in a variety of keys and enjoyed themselves so much, I sang another few sing-along standards. The downside of pandering to the mob was that the team remained in the lounge for a lot longer than they intended. Before they finally departed, Michael requested the voyage again, and just to be rid of the team, I sang it a second time. After a short break, I opened the second part of the show with just another tone, and at the end of the song, a girl with purple spiky hair and a ring in her nose came to the front of the stage and requested London Calling by The Clash. 
I told her that I didn't know the words and announced another original song. The girl called me a dickhead and went back to her table. After seven or eight more songs, I announced that I was finishing with Don't Give Up Till It's Over. The small crowd joined in on the chorus and gave me a loud round of applause. As I was stepping off the stage, the boss came towards me with a rigid expression. It's only eight o'clock, or it's only eleven o'clock, where are you going? I've played for almost an hour and three quarters, my usual set's an hour and a half. The boss glanced at some people getting up to leave. If you want to get paid, get back up there for at least another half hour. I don't want to lose the small crowd I have. I'm already losing money on you. I hesitated, then reluctantly got back on stage trying to think of what song I might sing. A newcomer in the audience raised his glass and requested the voyage. I explained that I played the voyage twice already, but the newcomer didn't care. Do it again. I drew a weary breath and sang the voyage for the third time. After I completed the extra half hour, I picked up my fee and left the club with or the bar without accepting a complimentary drink that the boss offered me. When I reached the BNB, I went straight to bed. I woke just after five the following morning, feeling deeply depressed. After tossing and turning for an hour, I switched on the light and glanced around the dingy room. A faded print of a purple mountain landscape on the damp wall facing my bed made me wince. So this is what it's come to. In an attempt to forget where I was, I decided to read in bed till it was time to go down for breakfast. I got my book from my guitar bag, and after getting back under the covers, located my page marker. Near the bottom of the left-hand page, the passage that I underlined the day before got my attention. Our Lord was made a nobody for us, and we all stand with him to be made nobodies in the same way until we come into his glory. While reflecting on these words, the trophy cup that the team captain Mikey had handed me the night before came into my head, and at the same time I remembered a passage from Matthew's Gospel where, after the mother of two of the apostles asked Jesus for a privileged place in heaven for our sons, Jesus rebukes her. Can they drink the cup that I'm about to drink? One, four, six. Yeah. Out of the blue one day, I was, uh, I was at home and, and the phone rang. And uh, the matron at the local hospital, the University Hospital in Galway, came on the line. And she said, a friend of hers had just, uh, the week before, played with my, an album I brought out called Flame. And uh, she was so struck, she said, by my voice that uh, she wondered, would I come in and sing at a memorial mass for the deceased members of the staff at the hospital, doctors and nurses, surgeons. And uh, it kind of took me by surprise. There was no mention of fear or anything like that. It was just, uh, would you like to do it? And I said, I will, on one condition, that you allow me to write all the songs for myself. And she hesitated. And she said, oh, but I, I really had my mind set on Ave Maria. I said, well, you've come to the wrong person for Ave Maria. I said, there's no way I'd be able to do that. Uh, but I said, I'll try and come up with a song in the same vein, if you like. And, uh, she said, okay, but you've only got five weeks. So um, when I put the phone down, I remember saying to myself, Jesus, what have you got yourself into? But anyway, I got my guitar and I started working. And it eventually became an album my brother called The Burning World. And um, The Burning World is the kind of song that you would never, ever get played on the radio in Ireland. It actually got me in for trouble with a DJ who was from RT, who was based on in Cork, because of a, a fellow who likes my songs rang up this DJ one day and said, Would you play this song for me? He said, It's one of my favourite songs. And he said, I can't do that, and I'm not going to do that. And he said, Why? And uh, he said, It's a great song, why wouldn't you play it? And uh, the DJ said, well, 
it wouldn't be suitable for my program. And, uh, and then you know, he said, I was at a Johnny doing it, and he said, a while back, and he said, the few teachers won't play any songs that he, Johnny has written that have anything to do with religion. And I said, uh, well, it's strange. I said, they, but anyway, the fellow told him to get lost. And uh, John came on. I'm giving the fellow's name away now. <laughs> but he can't, this, the DJ anyway, in particular doesn't play my songs anymore, any of them. But he, he came on on this night and he said, did Johnny do who put you up to this? On air, just before he went off air. And uh, some fellow rang me out of the blue and said, if some fellow's really after insulting you on the radio, did you hear it? So I went back down and I listened, and I called him up and I said, Jesus, what did you do that for? He said, well, this guy rang, texted me in some stuff, and I thought it was coming from you. I said, I don't know that guy. He was just attended my gig. Anyway, that's the song we're talking about. And the mass went lovely. It was only about, about three times as many people that are here now. And I sang it on the altar in the university church. And uh, strangely enough, a Limerick man came up to me after it. He was upstairs, probably no longer with us now. A younger man than myself, but he told me that he was in for some heavy ends. But, uh, it was a great success, and I thought that was the end of it. They had tea and biscuits at the end of it, as a lot of these functions do, you know. Uh, but a week later, the matron rang me again, and she said, we're going to Lourdes now, and we'd love you to go. <laughs> I said, I'm not really, my father was a, a, an agnostic, and a very skeptical man about all these things, and he kind of put that into me, you know. So she said, but wouldn't it be lovely to sing your new song over there? And I said, it would be nice, all right. I said, we have the altar booked right in front of the grotto where Our Lady appeared. And I said, well, okay, we'll do it. And I went over there with them. And it was one of the best experiences in my life. Uh, not because I sang at the grotto, because we didn't. Because a cardinal got in a week before and elbowed us out. And uh, it, the, the Mass never took part down at the grotto. But this is... I'll read you this section and you'll see why I, I thought it was so. So I, the whole chapter is called the procession. And they, they have these processions at the end of all these people, invalids going there. And they're magnificent things, really. The procession started moving very slowly. People began to light their candles around us. I lit mine and helped Deirdre light hers. In the growing twilight, the line of flickering flames ahead of us gave the proceedings a fairy tale quality. Leaning on her crutches, Deirdre inched along beside me, struggling to keep her candle aloft, while at the same time maintaining a hold of the handles of her crutches. This is my sixth trip, my second on crutches. I was in one of those before that. She raised her right crutch and pointed it at a wheelchair. The first time I came in a wheelchair was humiliating. I was paralyzed from head to toe after a massive stroke. I couldn't do anything for myself. The stroke came out of the blue while I was having my tea one evening after a long day at the post office where I worked. I was 45 at the time. I'm 51 now. The thought of telling her that she looked younger than her years passed through my mind, but I didn't lie. Had you no family to support? Both my parents died the year before it happened. Maybe that contributed to it. I never married. I have a sister in Canada. She came home for a month and was great support, but she had to return to her family then. She has six children. How did you manage to get back on your feet? Dogged determination. Relearning how to talk properly was one of the hardest challenges. Your speech seems perfect now. Almost. She drew a long breath. I suppose I keep coming back here out of a sense of gratitude, or maybe it's fear that the bloody thing might happen again. You're a brave woman. Deirdre smiled. That song you keep singing for us, don't give up till it's over, hits the nail on the head. It was terrific the other day 
at that retreat center up in the Pyrenees, and the whole group joined in in the chorus. I'll never forget that. I thought back to the moment Deirdre was alluding to, a moment that would live long in my memory also. After an outdoor mass, I sang this song as a request for a man suffering from autism. And the whole group of invalids on crutches and in wheelchairs spontaneously joined my fellow musicians, Charlie and Anne, in singing the chorus with tremendous spirit. Don't give up till it's over. Don't quit if you can. The weight upon your shoulder will make you a stronger man. Yeah, I'll just leave it there. Sing. Why not sing just another time before I do? Uh, I'll do two songs. The old spinster is going insane. Her next door neighbor is in church again. Two drunks are fighting down in the lane Little children are playing again Dogs are barking and little girls sing And the chapel bell begins to ring Someone deals Bobby a king And the pavement money starts to ring the street is drifting into the evening while the sun is going down. I'm just back there capturing the feeling, though it's just another time. Just another time. Cripple crawls up the avenue. Oh, and someone else says, How do you do? Someone kicks a ball over to you while the sky begins to lose its hue. And a group of old steel doors from the ships come up the street and from the hills. One takes a cigarette from his lips Someone else drops the coin he flips Oh, the street is drifting into evening While the sun is going down I'm just back there capturing the feeling Though it's just another time just in the tunnel. And in the band room up on the hill, a brass band's playing, I can hear it still. The slight trombone softly blows. The old nurse is on her way to the shop. The epileptic he suddenly dropped. Down the hill my father's in the docks. In the bar the drinking never stops. Bobby throws down a pair of queen. The church bell interrupts someone's dream. Someone's talking a football team Some girl is straightening her nylons Oh, the street is drifting into evening While the sun is going down I'm just back there capturing the feeling Though it's just another time Yeah.
if you can the way on your shoulder will make you strong man grasp your nickel tightly and it won't burn treat your failures lightly your luck is bound to turn so don't